<laughs> I think it's time to begin church. It's been lit up there. We're glad that you're here this morning. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. It's good to see you this day as we gather to worship and enjoy the presence of God. And we can also enjoy this community of faith that we have here among us. This is uh, one of the values of being able to gather on Sundays is to know that you have people you can connect with and a community to share life with. And the best way to take advantage of that is to work on building those relationships. So I encourage you to take a moment to say hello to the people around you, uh, get to know them a little bit, make a new friend, and I promise you God will bring good things in your life through that. Uh, if you're new to us, we've got cards in the pew rack that says I'm new on one side. Please fill that out. On the other side, it's the place to put prayer requests down, and so if you have any, please fill that out as well, and we get all those prayer requests to our prayer network. We have dozens and dozens of people praying, and we would love to include you in those prayers, so please fill that card out, put it in the offering plate when it comes by later in the service. You can go to the website, fpcdouglasville.org. You can, if you're new, you can fill out the information there. You can submit a prayer request to the website. And you can go to Next Steps and see everything that's coming up, all the activities, and the calendar. If you just want to know when something's happening, all of that is on the website. Please feel free to take advantage of that. Hopefully it's a good resource for you. Let me highlight a couple of things that are in your bulletin insert that you'll want to know about. One is this Friday night is our Parents' Night Out offered by our children's ministry and student ministry. We will uh, take your kids for three hours from 6 to 9 Friday night, they've got a uh, water bash happening, Lots, uh, so expect them to get wet, so plan accordingly, and, uh, and just come back and get them. That's primarily what we ask, is that you come back and get them, so that we're not opening a lodging program for children you've left behind. <laughs> One of the, we also have a way to serve. Uh, we're going to be in the first Saturday in August serving the community with our uh, FPC um, Presence, first presence in the community. We've got four projects we're going to be doing. We'd love for you to sign up for one of them. They're on the other side of that wall there, what we call Missions Hall. You can also donate any items that are, been, are listed here for the first responders. We're going to be just saying thank you to. And, uh, and then the following day, uh, first Sunday of August, we're going to have our fall kickoff, and we're going to be roasting a pig again, a whole pig. Was anybody there last year? Did you enjoy that pig? Man, I did. That's good stuff. But we have chicken, too, for those who uh, don't like pork. And there's probably going to be vegetables and some side dish. You can go crazy on that if that's your thing, too. Um, just come on and enjoy the day. All we need to know is how many are coming. We don't need names or anything like that, just a number to prepare for. And so there you'll see a board out in the narthex that you can place a tick mark on for every member you plan to bring with you and that we can plan appropriately for that. You'll also see next to the board of table in Narthex uh, for signing up for volunteering for children's ministry on Sunday morning. You know, one of the advantages we have because we're not a large church is that we can have a high volunteer to child ratio in our children's ministry. And our kids, because of that, know that they're loved. And that's a big deal. It's a big deal for parents, too. I remember when my kids were little, you could uh, work me like a dog, treat me however you want to treat me. But if you showed my kids that you loved them, that was all I needed. That made a big difference for me. And I know that makes a difference for all the parents who come. And so help us to love those kids on Sunday morning by signing up to volunteer. You've got different kind of slots available. You've got information here about it. You can sign up out in the narthex. Now, friends, let's uh, stand together as we join together in our intro to worship this morning. Please remain standing for our call to worship, which today comes from Isaiah 40, and you can see the responsive reading in your bulletin. They who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Please join me in prayer. 
Heavenly Father, we gather today to give you the honor that is due to your holy name. We worship you because of the saving grace you have extended to us in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You are the source of all goodness, and you are the light of the world, bringing light to our darkness. All praise and glory and honor are yours, now and forevermore. Amen. We join together in singing hymn number 353, For the Beauty of the Earth. Please be seated. As we move into a time of confession today, we remember these words, the words of the psalmist who testifies, happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. While I kept silence, my body wasted away through groaning all day long, but day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you. I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. It's in the strength of this assurance that we take a moment of silence to come and confess our sin to Almighty God. Please join me in prayer. And now we join together in saying the prayer of confession, which you can see in the bold paragraph in your bulletin. Sovereign Lord, you are slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Forgive us for disregarding your call to holy living. You call us to be salt and light to the world, but we have not lived with such distinction. Forgive our apathy, our selfishness, and our failure to live in a way that honors you. Wash away our sins and restore us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Scripture tells us that as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. And as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our sins from us. The Lord hears the cry of the repentant heart and forgives our sin. Thanks be to God. Amen.
please be seated. I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to read Luke 17, 20 to 37. And uh, let me just remind you, we're in this series where we are working our way through the entire gospel of Luke. And as I said before, at times when you do that, you can't skip some text which you don't really want to preach about, or they're too hard because you said we're going to go through the whole book. And I think you're going to find today one of those, one more of those examples. And, uh, and I, you know, you're going to be scratching your head. But don't worry, even the best of us do that. I was listening to a guy named R.C. Sproul. He's a pretty well-known Reformed theologian and preacher. When he commented before preaching on this text, he said, I have no idea what's being said here. <laughs> Some people says it's this. Some people that says it's this. I'm going to tell you both, and you can figure it out. And the end is like, I don't know, your guess is good as mine. However, we're not going to go there. Hopefully you'll find, I know there are some things we can be certain of, but I promise you I will not be able to answer in the time allotted everything about this text. It would be fun to sit down for about an hour and we could walk through all of it. But let us uh, turn our attention to what God would say to us today in the Gospel of Luke. Let me pray to get us started. Eternal and loving Father, as we come before you this morning in search of hearing your guidance for us in this day and at this time and in this season of life, we pray that as we encounter your word from Luke 17, that you would open our eyes in a way that allows us to behold the wonder of your word and change us by it for good. And we pray in the same manner that David prayed in the Psalms and asked that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts are found worthy in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Listen to the word of God from Luke 17, 20 to 37. Being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus answered them, The kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there. For behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. And he said to the disciples, the days are coming when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look there. Or look here, do not go out or follow them. For as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. But first, he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all so will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, let the one who is on the housetop with his goods in the house not come down to take them away, and likewise let the one who is in the field not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will keep it. I tell you that night... In that night, there will be two in one bed. One will be taken and the other left. There will be two women grinding together. One will be taken and the other left. And they said to him, where, Lord? And he said to them, where the corpse is, the vultures will gather. Friends, the prophet Isaiah said that the grass withers and the flower fades but the word of the Lord stands forever, and this is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Easy, right? I think the question that is most often asked in response to this text and texts like this is that this is a text about the end time. So 
Are we living in the end times? Have you requested that? Somebody thinks we are. Is that something that you have thought about? Probably. I mean, are we even living in those days where, as the band R.E.M. sings, are we near the end of the world as we know it, right? It's a really popular topic, and it's uh, particularly true during times when life seems fragile, chaotic, and dangerous. And I think a lot of us look fearfully at our world today and think, I mean, of all times, isn't this the time that we would say the end is near? And after last night's assassination attempt on Trump, you just, it just heightens that sense of how have we become so broken? How have we generated so much animosity to fellow human beings? How have we turned so angrily against one another and lost that sense of the common humanity and dignity that we share as people of God? It's difficult, isn't it, to look at this world and, and to think, Surely the end is near. Well, there have been a lot of times that people have tried to predict that. A lot of times over 2,000 years that people said, oh, this is it. I mean, turn of 1,000 A.D., turn of 2,000 A.D., if you're old enough to remember Y2K, right? Lots of times people said, oh, man, the end is near, and thus far they've been wrong. It hasn't happened yet. You've not missed anything, I promise. Uh, the, it has not happened yet. So what about now? Like right now? Is now, the live, are we living in the end times? And the answer is a definite yes. It's distinctively yes. We are living in the end times. Your agreement with that is probably predicated on just how long is, does that end take? Just how long does that end take is probably going to dictate whether or not you believe we're in in the end times. You see, there are long endings and there are short endings. Are we living in the ending like a southern goodbye, which kind of begins in the house, continues on the front doorstep, and finally concludes on the sidewalk out front, right? That's a long goodbye. Or there's the goodbyes you give to the telemarketer who calls you when it's not convenient for you, which is all the time, right? That's a short goodbye. Unless I guess you're really bored and just want to talk to somebody. Those are short goodbyes. There's long goodbyes or short goodbyes. We're definitely living in the end times, but in my estimation, and those uh, particularly in the Reformed tradition, this is a long goodbye. And I think this passage helps us see that. There's a lot here, as I said, I can't unpack for you. That would be a Sunday school lesson, which would be a lot of fun to have. But in the time that I've got, let me just say, I think there's four things that we can know about the last days, the end times of this world, and the establishment of the kingdom of God that Jesus teaches us in this text. Four things. One is the kingdom of God, which Matthew calls the kingdom of heaven. They're synonymous. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is already present. Number two, Jesus will return to complete the plan for the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Three, no one knows when that will happen. And four, when Jesus returns, there won't be time to change your mind about him. Let's walk through those. Number one, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, as Matthew calls it, is already present. This text is based on a conversation that Jesus has with the Pharisees and the disciples. The Pharisees ask him, when will the kingdom of God come? They had the idea that was common for people of Israel, actually common for the disciples too. They had the idea that the arrival of the kingdom of God would be signaled by a massive military intervention and a restoration of Israel's political power and authority. It was, in a sense, when the kingdom of God would come, was that the kingdom of David would be restored. It would be an earthly kingdom. Israel would no longer live under the thumb of the Roman Empire. They would have independence, they would have power, and they would have the same kind of success that they had in the days of David. And that's their vision of it. And so when they say, when's it going to come? If you're the Messiah which is what Jesus presented himself to be. If you're the Messiah, when's the kingdom going to come? And he threw everything upside down, and he said to them, the kingdom of God 
is in your midst, which means it is present. What he was saying is that the kingdom of God was there in Jesus. Essentially, he was saying, wherever Jesus was and is, the kingdom of God was and is present. I know that's a complicated sentence, the point being that when the kingdom of God was present in Jesus then, the kingdom of God is present in Jesus now. Wherever Jesus is, the kingdom of God is already present. And this was confusing not only to the Pharisees, but to the disciples. So Jesus takes a moment to talk to them, because he has more pity on them, I think, than the Pharisees in this situation, because the disciples gave up their life to follow Jesus, and when Jesus, and, to, and longing for the coming of the kingdom of God, and when Jesus said to them, the kingdom of God is already here, the question that was on their minds then was this question, if the kingdom of God is here, is this as good as it gets? Because not only were they part of the Jewish experience living under the occupation and authority of Rome, but they were now disciples who were held in contempt by the Jewish leaders of their day. They had fallen to the bottom of all the power structures, and if the kingdom of God was already present, is this as good as it gets? What about the rule of the new king of Israel? What about the power? What about the might? Is this it? And so Jesus takes some time to talk to them in more detail about the kingdom of God, and it's a bit difficult to navigate through it, but I think what he offers, they understood better than we understood. That's just a given. The people to whom Jesus is speaking have all the context and the culture and history to understand better than what we understand. But there are some things that we can understand about what Jesus is saying. Jesus said to them, when he, the Son of Man, suffered and was rejected by their generation, then they would see more clearly the reality of the kingdom of God already in their midst. He's saying, you don't understand it now, but you will see it. You will understand it. And that indeed is what happened. The Son of Man was rejected by his generation. The Son of Man was killed, but the Son of Man was raised. Jesus was raised three days later and inaugurated the kingdom of, of God. It was when, they, when they, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they were commissioned to be the church. They could look back and say, yes, we understand what Jesus meant when he began his preaching saying, repent. For why? For the kingdom of God is near. Saying the kingdom of God is now. And you're going to experience it now. And the disciples' natural response was, well, where? If it's not a seat on the throne in Jerusalem, where? Where are we going to see the kingdom of God? And Jesus answers in a way that I think is a little bit troubling to us. It sounds really uh, strange. He says, where the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Makes common sense, right? It's intuitive. No, it's not. What Jesus is saying is that you know something is dead when you see the effect it has on the activity of the vultures, Right? You see the vultures, and you know something's dead. You don't know something's dead and then see the vulture to confirm it. You see the vultures, and you know something is dead. And what Jesus was saying is that in comparison, you will know the kingdom is present by the effect it has on the activity of the citizens of the kingdom of God. What he's saying is that wherever Jesus is at work in people's lives through the Holy Spirit, there the kingdom of God is present. That is a present reality where there's a person who's trying to submit himself or herself to the reign of Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God is present. The kingdom of God is present now. And we can see the evidence of it where Jesus is at work already. What Jesus is saying to us as citizens of the kingdom of heaven is it's a reality now. And through your life, People ought to see the effects of it. In a world of violence, polarization, this increasing inhumane behavior, we are to become people who exhibit the effect of the presence of God. We make it visible. We make this reality visible to people in the way we fulfill, for example, the words of Micah 8 who says, He has told you, O man, what is required of you. That you love kindness, you do justice, you love kindness, 
and you walk humbly with your Lord. He says, if you want to win your life, lose it, right? That's the kingdom reality. The kingdom of God is present, and wherever you or I exhibit that reality, people will see it. Second thing he says is that Jesus will return to complete the plan for the kingdom of God. It's not over yet. This is not as good as it gets. That's kind of obvious when you look around and see the realities of our day is that this is not as good as it gets because the work is not over. When Jesus returns, the end will be complete. As he says, on that day, and on that day when the Son of Man returns, he says it's going to be a singular moment that brings division. He said there are going to be one person, two people in bed, one's going to be taken, one's going to be left. There's going to be two women grinding, one's going to be taken, one's going to be left. What he's saying is that those who trust in Christ, who are still alive, when Jesus returns, when the Son of Man returns, will be taken to heaven, and those who don't will enter hell. But there's a finality to this, right? He says on that day, when the Son of Man returns, on that day, there's a finality to it. Now, nothing happens after this moment in Jesus' teaching about this return of the Son of Man or the full establishment of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. There's nothing more that happens after this moment. Now, that's important. If you see in this text this idea of the rapture, all Christian doctrine includes a moment when those who are alive at the return of Christ were taken to heaven. Everybody does. But there's this idea called the rapture, if you're not familiar with it, in which Jesus comes for kind of a first return to take those who believe into heaven before a final seven-year period called the tribulation where those who are left behind get kind of a second chance before the final return of Jesus. Now, the way Jesus is talking in this text about that end doesn't allow for seven more years. It's done. It's over. Whatever you think about the rapture, this is not the place to, to, approve, to um, support that. It's in an instant that Jesus is going to return, and it's an instant where those who are people of faith are going to be taken up in an instant. There's nothing left beyond it. It's a final moment. And thirdly, no one knows when this is going to happen. Forget the TV shows about the end times. No one's going to know when this happens. The end will come when people are not expecting it. We will be doing our normal things, as he describes in the story of Lot and Noah. We're going to be working, playing, living, marrying, doing the things that are about the ordinary activities of life. We're not going to be able to predict the end any more than we can predict when lightning will streak across the sky, he says. I think when Jesus says in Matthew 24, I don't even know when the end is going to come. To dabble in predictions about when the end is going to come, to answer a question that Jesus doesn't even know the answer to is probably one of the more prideful games that we can play. But we will get tired of waiting, Jesus says. We don't know when it's going to happen, but we will get tired of waiting, which inclines us to the game of predictions. I understand that. The disciples are warned that days will come when they'll want to be back in the days where Jesus was with them back to the times where everybody thought they were crazy among their family and friends and the Jewish leaders were hostile towards them. They're going to be want to be back to that place because the days are going to come when this broken world just becomes so unbearable. And I think all of us can get a sense of what that feels like. There's days when we're so sick and tired of how sin and this broken world inflict so much pain on us. We're sick and tired of carrying the burden of its consequence and the temptation, I think, is to just jump on any indication that the end has arrived. In fact, after Jesus, the period of this period in history with Jesus lived and did his ministry, there are other people who came along and said, hey, I'm the Messiah. Hey, I'm, I'm Jesus who has returned. And let me assure you, they were all wrong. But there will continue to be many people in this world who say, Oh, it's happening tomorrow, or it's happening in this time. And we're gonna, people are going to be tempted to jump on it and do what they say. But the, there will be, despite the reports, none of them will be accurate. 
Jesus will come, and it's a surprise to everyone when that will happen, even to Jesus. Four, when Jesus returns, there won't be time to change your mind about him. When Jesus returns, people, as I said, are going to be doing the normal things. Even though it's referencing Noah and Lot, Jesus was not highlighting the sin of those stories, but was highlighting the surprise ending of those stories. People were just carrying on their normal days, sleeping, eating, and so forth. And what Jesus was saying is that when, it talked, when, we, when you're thinking about the end days and the return of Christ, what's at stake is the nature of our dispositions, our commitments, and what's ultimately most important in our lives. What's at stake is what do we place as the supreme meaning and purpose and loyalty of our lives? Is it to focus on who God is as revealed to us in Jesus Christ, or is it to just spend our time laboring away in the things that this world says, this is the important stuff? When the ordinary things of our life become a higher priority, now, what does it mean to be people of God who are living out the kingdom of God in this world? Then we are in great danger, Jesus says. It is those who have as their greatest loyalty and priority in life the following of Jesus and exhibiting his kingdom, the ones that are going to be ready when that time comes. There won't be a chance to change. And why should there be? I mean, you're, you're talking about the moment when those who believe are going to spend an eternity with God. If you didn't spend a second thinking about that, didn't spend the time wondering who this Jesus is and whether or not you want to spend eternity with him, what happens if you get into eternity and you don't like him? You want to figure that out now. And so why do you need another chance? You won't have a moment to decide. I mean, think about it. When we, when we think about our own death in this world, we, we want to plan well for that, right? And I, I, those who plan well, the ones who go to the lawyer and get all the legal documents, the wills, the power of attorney, that say to the kids, you get this, you get this. You know, put your little pink dot on the things you want. You put your yellow dot on the things you want, right? You divide up your kingdom before they even... It's your time to die, right? You, you do all the things that you plan on making life work well for everybody once you die. If you haven't done that, please do that. I don't know about the sticker thing, but get your legal affairs in order. We've had several instances here recently where that has not been the case. People have den been in denial. I don't know. They just haven't done the work, and it created a mess for their family. So sidebar, plan for your end of your life well and get your legal affairs in order. But we do all that stuff. And we do all of it mindful of this human kingdom that we have, and our kingdoms are so small. Like even the wealthiest kingdoms in comparison to the kingdom of God are so small, so transient, so temporary. Why would we not also then want to prepare well for the end of our life with the greatest kingdom of all, the kingdom of God? The final word from Jesus is that there will come a time when it will be too late to get your spiritual life in order. Now is the time to do that. And if you're wondering why, well, let me just add this on. to what This is just an uh, extra biblical lesson. It's not what Jesus said here, but it's true. He says in other places, this is what you can be sure of, is that life will be infinitely good in the final plan of the kingdom of God. Life in heaven will be infinitely good. There's nothing that's going to be lost. There will be no more grieving, no more tears, no more sorrow, no more, no more pain. See, the disciples thought that the kingdom of God would be infinitely good on earth. But Jesus had a better offer. Jesus always has a better offer. He offered an eternal kingdom that his death would open up wide for all of us who believed in him when we died. Death, 
the end, if we trust Jesus, means that everything just gets better. Are you ready for that? Let's pray. Sovereign and holy God, we recognize that we are very limited in our ability to see the fullness of your kingdom. But we pray, God, that you would give us eyes to see enough that we would orient our hearts and lives around you, that we would make you and what it means to conform our life to your son, Jesus Christ, as the highest priority, the greatest good, the singular purpose for our existence. Because we know that in the time that we have to pursue Jesus here, such a small time, compared to the full eternal reality of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, for those who trust you. Help us to shift our priorities now because there will be a time when it's too late to make you the center of our lives and to make our days here the most fruitful possible in being people who so act on behalf of the kingdom of God as a present reality that we would be assigned to others of the same kingdom that they can experience. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing together, Be Still My Soul, hymn 530.
Amen. Please remain standing as we say together our affirmation of faith, which today comes from the book of Colossians, the first chapter. It's in the bold paragraph. We say together, Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. As we listen to the anthem today, I'd invite you to consider how God is speaking to you today. It's in worship that we give ourselves to God. Worship is an act of self-giving, and we give of our time, of our talents, and of our treasures. Uh, with that in mind, I'd like to invite the ushers forward to receive the morning tithes and offerings.
Good and gracious God, it is the sincere desire of our hearts to be good stewards of all that you give. Father, for health and breath, uh, for the voices we have, Father, for uh, our gifts, skills, abilities, for these tithes, these offerings. Father, we pray that as a community we would use all that you've given for the glorification of your name, God, that honor would be brought to your name in this community, but also to the ends of the earth through our global missions. And we pray, God, that you would help us in this endeavor, uh, that your name may be glorified. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Please be seated. You recognize that there are joys and tribulations in life, and there are ups and downs, good times and challenging times. And so if there is anyone who would like to speak with a pastor after the service today, I'll be greeting folks outside in our foyer area, which we call our narthex. Uh, if you'd like to, perhaps we can take a moment and pray if you can stay a while, or uh, perhaps we can arrange a time to, to pray during the week. And that's something I'm happy to do, that James is happy to do. So please know that that's available to you. Now let's go together to the Lord in prayer. Good and gracious God, what a privilege it is to, to hear your word and to receive your word, uh, that it edifies us and uplifts us in spirit. Father, we thank you for your word to us today. Lord God, we recognize that you, Lord Jesus, are the one who has inaugurated, who has brought in the, the, the reality of the kingdom of God on this earth and in our lives, that uh, your effective reign, wherever that may be, geographically or within the human heart, and enacted through where our feet tread in your name, God. We, we thank you for the the kingdom that is expanding, uh, and for the various ways in which the light of Christ is made manifest through the actions of your church, Lord, uh, around the world. Father, we thank you for this work of yours in our lives. We just hear that, uh, that word about the importance of time today. Help us not to take it for granted. Help us not to be complacent. We recognize that there are those who are far from you. Uh, and Father, we pray that you would help us be a people who are attentive to the promptings of your Spirit, that if there's a word to be spoken, uh, that we will be sensitive to, to when and how to do that, Father, that those who are far from you may be drawn near. Your word says you desire that none should perish. And so we pray that you help us to, to be attentive to you and your Spirit's promptings, that in our conversations and interactions, you would point the way to Jesus, the Lord and giver, of life, who grants to us eternal life, and who we frankly don't know when you may return. That could be imminently, as much as it could be uh, some time from now, Father. We don't know, but in that reality, we pray we will not be complacent. Father, we are thankful for this community in which we live. Father, we just are mindful of our community representatives. We think of our, our mayor and the councillors who work with her. We think of uh, our uh, County Commissioner and all the commissioners who work with him. Father, we, we pray for all those in the judicial system who, who seek to labor on our behalf. We thank you for each one. Father, we pray that they would know godly counsel and that you would guide them and equip them and strengthen them for the work that they do. It's as we pray this, Father, that we are mindful of that uh, attempted assassination on former President Donald Trump, Father. And that's something that ought to just disturb every person in this country deeply. God, that is, you, know, you speak, you know, thou shalt not murder, and there was an attempted murder. Father, we, we pray for our nation. Father, just struck by the words of Condoleezza Rice. Father, we just pray that um, in our time, God, there would be a repudiation of violence, that God, uh, the, that political temperature would be lowered, and that we would uphold the hallmarks of a healthy democracy. Father, we pray that 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 would be true in greater measure for our nation, even as we see some of these disturbing signs around us. God, we uh, pray for godly leadership. We recognize it's an election year. And Father, we, we pray uh, for, for godly leaders and folks who would be uh, perceptive and receptive to um, counsel from, from people who know your way and seek to walk in it, God, that our nation as a whole would be guided in the way of Christ that is right and true and good. Father, we uh, are just thankful for ministry partners around the world. And today we think of Seba Banda and the ministry that she's involved with. We thank you for the ability to support her and the great work that they're doing there. We think of the new church that's being built in Pista in Tet Province in Mozambique. 
uh, through the work of the Holistic Evangelism Project that she heads up. And God, we pray that this work would be a wonderful thing, that the folks who are, are currently meeting, the 70 folks who are meeting under a grass roof supported by some poles, uh, would later this year have a, have a new church in which to gather and meet. We pray for the six new wells that have recently been dug uh, that are going to support 200 to 600 families with fresh water. It's a part of the world where uh, they use the phrase, water is life, because it literally is. Father, we thank you for this work, and we pray that you would continue to bless and help Seba as uh, the project seeks to equip lay leaders, because there are only three pastors for more than 80 churches in the region. And so uh, we pray that you would guide her and help her as they seek to equip uh, those communities in Tip Province and Mozambique, that they would be a strong, vibrant church that is a church that testifies to the Lord and Savior that we have, the Savior of the world, our Lord Jesus Christ in whose name we pray and who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, friends, let's stand as we sing our final hymn today, hymn number 643, I Know Not Where the Road Will Lead. And as we do that, I'd encourage you to stay for the benediction response uh, because we'll be singing that together as well. Please stand. Friends, as you go into the rest of this day and into the rest of this week, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. This day and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace. Have a great week.